I'm Tracy Sable tonight on EWTN News Nightly. Race for the White House. Front runner Donald Trump gains an important endorsement while President Joe Biden releases a new campaign video. Oral arguments. The Supreme Court is considering a case that involves the Little Sisters of the Poor. We have analysis. Seeking better care. Why there are calls for more faith based options for foster children in the United States. And barking for blessings. A beloved tradition in Spain attracts the furriest of the faithful. These stories and more tonight. From EWTN, the Global Catholic Network, this is EWTN News Nightly. Thank you for being with us on the Feast of St. Anthony of Egypt. We begin tonight with the race for the White House with just days to go until next Tuesday's primary. Republicans are turning their attention to New Hampshire, and so is President Joe Biden, who is also drawing attention with a campaign video about beating former President Donald Trump. White House correspondent Owen Jensen reports. Next Tuesday, voters in New Hampshire get their chance to pick which Republican they want to see run for the Oval Office. Of course, former President Donald Trump coming off that big win in Iowa, so the pressure is on for Nikki Haley and Ron DeSantis to make their move or possibly make their exit. And President Joe Biden, whose poll numbers are stuck in low approval territory, thinks he can do again what he did in 2020. President Joe Biden trying to hold on to office for a second term releases this video. You know, it's kind of funny. All these Republican candidates in the primary are trying to beat Donald Trump. And I'm still the only person to ever beat Donald Trump. And I'm looking forward to do it again for the good of this country. And former President Donald Trump, coming off a 30-point victory in Iowa, is currently well positioned to be the Republican nominee in November. It's time for the Republican Party, however, to unify, come together, and move forward as one team. We have to beat crooked Joe Biden. We have to beat him. And now Trump has the endorsement of Vivek Ramaswamy, who dropped out of the race after the Iowa caucuses. We met in person, and I told him that I would endorse Donald J. Trump for president of the United States and do everything in my power to lead us to victory in this war. For former U.N. Ambassador Nikki Haley and Florida Governor Ron DeSantis, their paths to victory become even more difficult heading into the Granite State. They finished far behind in the caucus Monday. We're going to bring in the administrative state and put it back under constitutional accountability. That doesn't happen by just snapping your fingers. You need a methodical, strong, disciplined executive to be able to do that. Um, you know, the, the Trump, his, his kind of, um, uh, the way he would run things, very chaotic. DeSantis got about 21% of the vote in Iowa, 30 points behind Trump, and two points ahead of Haley's third place finish. As for another GOP debate, Haley will not do one in any forum that does not also include the former president. Tomorrow, President Biden heads to North Carolina for another speech on Bidenomics as he tries to convince voters his economic agenda is working. He recently said 2023 was a great year for American workers, but he also acknowledged some prices are still too high for too many Americans. At the White House, Owen Jensen, EWTN News Nightly. And off the campaign trail and into the courtroom where a judge threatened to throw former President Donald Trump out of his defamation trial. Trump repeatedly ignored warnings to stay quiet as writer E. Jean Carroll testified that he shattered her reputation after she accused him of sexual abuse. The trial is set to determine how much Trump, who has already been found liable for defaming Carroll, will pay in damages. As this was happening, a judge in the state of Maine delay delayed a decision, that is, that would block Trump's name from the state's primary ballot, saying the Supreme Court needs to rule first on a similar case coming out of Colorado. Well, President Joe Biden is meeting with congressional leaders at the White House to discuss a foreign aid bill. The proposed legislation aims to send money to Israel, Ukraine, Taiwan, and the U.S. border with Mexico. The sit-down comes one day after the Senate voted in favor of advancing a short-term funding extension. But challenges remain. Capitol Hill correspondent Eric Rosales has the latest. Good evening, Tracy. That stopgap funding bill cleared its first hurdle as senators still work out the details on the $1.6 trillion measure. If passed before Friday, it would prevent a partial government shutdown. Now, if both sides continue working in good faith, we can have the CR passed by tomorrow. If both sides continue working in good faith, we can avoid a shutdown without last-minute drama or needless anxiety for so many Americans. 
The government funding bill would extend shutdown deadlines to March 1st and March 8th to give both chambers time to approve a complete federal budget that's months overdue. However, Republican House Speaker Mike Johnson faces major hurdles in getting the bill across the finish line. Hardline conservatives in the House say the cuts don't go morning, far enough. Everybody. The speaker disagrees. Because of the adjustments that were made to the top line of 1.59, there was additional money that was spent, so we went in and carved it up. We got $16 billion in real cuts out of the IRS slush fund and the COVID slush funds the Biden administration uh, was so jealously guarding and protecting, and that's, that's an important improvement. If House Republicans can't come to terms, funds for key government agencies, including Veterans Affairs, Transportation, the Energy Department, and Housing will dry up. House Democratic leadership continue to say no pro-life measures will be allowed. We have to make sure that Republicans uh, don't, um, you know, continue to want to tank our our uh, appropriations process by supporting uh, writers that are anti-abortion, anti-LGBTQ. I mean, those are the types of things that will hurt this process. In order to prevent a partial government shutdown, the House and Senate have to pass a short-term funding extension and get it to the president's desk. The deadline is 11.59 p.m. Eastern Time on Friday. At the Capitol, Eric Rosales, EWTN. News nightly. Well, from Capitol Hill to the Supreme Court, where the justices heard oral arguments from one of the most closely watched cases of this term. And it includes an unlikely association with the Little Sisters of the Poor. For decades, some fishing boats had to pay for government mandated observers who track their fish intake. Recently, the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration decided a group of herring fishermen had to start paying for the inspectors. In Loper Bright Enterprises, Inc. versus Gina Raimondo, the fish Fishermen argue their exclusion from the original list meant they should not be liable for payments. At the center of the case is the Chevron Doctrine, a 40-year-old precedent in which courts give considerable leeway to federal agencies' interpretation of the laws that they administer. It is a precedent that plays out across all government agencies. So how does the Little Sisters of the Poor factor into the case. Well, the sisters filed a friend of the court brief last year in support of the fishermen. The nuns have had a number of victories fighting against attempts to force them to comply with contraception mandates implemented by the government. Both the nuns and fishermen are asking the Supreme Court for a major check on the Chevron doctrine. And here to explain why today's case is being scrutinized so closely is attorney William Hahn from Beckett Law. Well, great to be with you today. So in layman's terms, explain to us the Loper Bright case and how that could limit federal agency power. Sure. At the core of the Loper Bright case is a question of who decides. Do federal courts get to protect ordinary Americans from arbitrary regulatory power in the administrative state? Or does the administrative state get to say, we get to decide what the law means and what rights and protections you have? That's why the Little Sisters of the Poor came into this case. Because although they have won at the U.S. Supreme Court three times over the past 10 years, their legal odyssey, as one Supreme Court justice called it, to protect their ministry from the uh, Obamacare mandate on contraception and abortifacients is continuing precisely because of administrative power saying, you don't have religious freedom in this context today. Maybe you have it under a different administration, but then you'll maybe have it another way, a different time. The Little Sisters need a clear answer, and those answers come from clearly applying federal law. That's what courts do, and that's why the Little Sisters came into this case, so that the court can do what it's supposed to do, apply the law and protect Americans. Well, if the deference president is eliminated, how do you see the balance of power among the three branches of government shifting? I think the balance of power would return to how the Constitution allocates it. Everyone who's seen Schoolhouse Rock knows that there are only three branches of government. There's not three and a half or four. That includes the administrative state. The judiciary interprets the law that Congress makes and the executive enforces it. Unfortunately, what happened with the Little Sisters is that the executive took a law that didn't want a regulation requiring the Little Sisters to violate their religious beliefs and inserted one anyways, and then the courts it, although de ruling for the Little Sisters three times ultimately were just ignored in some ways by the Department of Health and Human Services and then also California and Pennsylvania trying to come up with other ways to use the administrative process to slow things down and stymie the Little Sisters protections. Clarity comes from the courts and that's why the Little Sisters are here in this case. Yeah, and there have been cases um, where agencies have abused the power of Chevron deference and it's led to the targeting of believers. Can you give us some examples there? 
Sure. So in addition to the Little Sisters case, a case involving the transgender mandate under Obamacare, which forced doctors to provide um, life-altering surgeries in violation of their religious beliefs and best medical judgment, this was enacted, uh, although, again, not supposed to be without religious exemptions. Again, federal agencies interpreted that requirement without any kind of religious accommodations, and it's only because a federal judge was willing to do what the Constitution requires courts to do, which is interpret the law and not simply let agencies tell courts what the law means, that, that, that those ministries and those doctors were able to be protected. Uh, that's another example. Time and again, we have seen administrative agencies not be respectful of the diverse religious beliefs in this country, and the Little Sisters want to see a government allocation of power Power that respects religious liberty. Well, we have uh, about a minute or so left, but really quickly, I mean, in the long run, how do you see this case affecting the freedoms and protections uh, that are afforded to religious organizations, churches, schools, and also ministries? Right. Chief Justice Roberts raised a question like this at oral argument about what happens if a federal agency says, well, we've just decided to apply the law in this way as to religious universities. Maybe they do it favorably, maybe they do it unfavorably. But what our Constitution points out is that structure and liberty are connected. How we allocate power lets us know whether or not our rights are protected. Our original allocation of power with three branches of government and limits allows for a protection for everyone and their fundamental freedoms. And the Little Sisters are in this case to restore that original allocation and protect religious liberty. Well, thank you so much for your insights on this important case. We appreciate it. Thank you very much. Well, the State Department has relisted the Houthis as a global terrorist group. It is in response to attacks on commercial ships in the Red Sea and the Gulf of Aden by the Iranian-backed militant group. The redesignation aims to block money and weapons from going back to the rebel group. The Biden administration removed the Houthis designation in February of 2021 over concerns that it could cripple critical assistance to the people of Yemen. Well, Pakistan has removed its ambassador to Iran. The decision is in response to recent airstrikes from Tehran that reportedly killed two children in Pakistan's capital city. Officials in Islamabad say the bombing was a violation of airspace. This illegal act is completely unacceptable and has no justification whatsoever. Pakistan reserves the right to respond to this illegal act and the responsibility for the consequences will lie squarely with Iran. According to Iran state media, the attacks were targeted toward a militant group. The strike has threatened to derail diplomatic relations between the neighboring countries. It could also further ignite violence in the Middle East. Uh, we have a lot more still to come here on EWTN News Nightly, including sounding the alarm. A new report examines the number of churches that are being vandalized in Canada and calls for improvement. How faith-based groups in the U.S. are seeking to help children in foster care. A new report finds since 2021, 33 churches in Canada have been burned to the ground. The study from CBC News says the majority of the fires were intentionally set. The new data comes on the heels of unsubstantiated reports of mass graves found at former Catholic and Christian residential schools. Well, a new study is shedding light on what it says are problems with foster care here in the United States. Currently, there are around 390,000 children in foster homes. According to numbers from the America First Policy Institute, one-third of foster children experience instability with at least three placements per year. And of those who are too old to remain in foster care, 20 percent of those children are left homeless. Recommendations from AFPI include increased support for faith-based groups and expanded tax credits for foster families. And joining us now to talk more about this is Dr. Rick Morton, Senior Vice President for Engagement for Lifeline Children's Services, a Christian organization providing outreach to vulnerable children. Dr. Morton, great to have you back on again. Um, these are really some heartbreaking findings uh, coming out of this report. What do you think can be done to help these children find their forever homes? A and what part can faith-based organizations play in all this? Well, I think faith-based organizations are key uh, we're in a crisis in America. You read just a moment ago, almost 400,000 children are engaged in the foster care system, even as we speak today. Um, many of those children are sleeping in hotel rooms, in 
overcrowded group homes, even on the floors of child welfare service offices because of the lack of people that are engaged. And we just really believe that the church is the answer. And we believe the church is the answer ultimately because, because God has first called us to be the one to care for orphan and vulnerable children and to emulate his care for us and his rescue of us in the way that we engage that work. And, and so we believe really that, that largely this is a PR crisis on some level. Uh, the churches just don't know. Believers within those churches just don't know about the crisis, about all the ways that they can be involved, um, but also that opportunities are, are being limited because of religious liberty challenges. Um, sometimes Christians are being frozen out of the system, and that's that's a problem as well. Yeah, so what do you think we can do as believers to help these children? Well, I, I think we can step up, and, and I think everyone can do something. Um, there are people within every church in America that have the ability to be able to foster a child to provide temporary care. Um, you know, that statistic that you read, uh, one-third of children in foster care experiencing that, you know, devastating instability of moving from home to home to home, that can be stopped when families commit to bringing a child from difficult circumstances into their home. And when a church commits to surrounding that family, supporting them, and, and giving them the things that they need in order to be able to do that work for the long haul. I think the other thing we have to do is the church has to meaningfully engage in the lives of birth families. Um, the American foster care system is built on the principle that, that family reunification is the first goal. And, and we have the ability in, in the church community, both in how we bring the gospel to bear, but also how we bring our presence and our community to bear around at-risk families and at around broken families to help them to not only be reunified, but to help them be successful um, so that their children can go home and stay home. And so it's a complex answer. Um, we have to have families that are ready to adopt. We have to have families that are ready to provide temporary care and then release children back to their birth families. And we have to have people that are willing to engage birth families um, at a high level. We have about 30 seconds left or so, but, but I want to talk about that again, that instability and how important stability is for children and, and having a stable family, a stable family environment. Quickly, talk to us about that. Well, God designed us to be nurtured in a family, and stability is key to our intellectual development. It's key to our social development. Um, children need predictability and they need trust. Um, they need to feel secure, and bouncing from one placement to another doesn't allow that. And so we have to fix the system in ways that allows children to be able to find stability even in the middle of difficult circumstances. It's so important. Dr. Morton, thank you for being with us and for all that you do. We appreciate it. God bless. Thank you. Up next on EWTN News Nightly, Center of Excellence, how a nonprofit aims to promote health care in the United States with an assist from the Vatican. Plus, a new breed of blessing in Spain on the feast of the country's patron saint of animals. In the UK, concerns about members of the royal family and their health. This after both Kensington and Buckingham palaces made surprise announcements. First, Catherine, the Princess of Wales, is in the hospital recovering from a planned abdominal surgery. A statement for the palace said the operation was successful and the princess will spend the next two weeks recovering. Shortly after the public announcement of Kate's surgery, it was revealed that King Charles would be heading to the hospital next week. Buckingham Palace said the 75-year-old will have a corrective procedure for an enlarged prostate. Oh, the largest pediatric hospital in Europe is part of the Vatican, and a new initiative is aimed at spreading the work being done at Bambino Jesu Hospital to other parts of the world. The recently established nonprofit Patrons of Bambino Jesu aims to promote health care projects in the United States while also raising funds. The Bambino Jesu provides care for children all over Europe and other parts of the world. It also has the distinction of having the world's largest database for rare diseases. Joining us now from Rome is Fabrizio Arangini Bentifogolio, president of Patrons of Bambino Gesù. Fabrizio, great to be with you today. Uh, so tell us, why did you start the Patrons of Bambino Gesù and what's been the response so far? Great to be here tonight uh, with you. Um, the hospital 
of Bambino Gesù in uh, Europe is a center of excellence that is recognized everywhere in the treating of uh, um, pediatric um, healthcare. And uh, it was thought a couple of years ago to expand to the U.S. in order to create awareness and uh, brand equity and promoting the activities of the hospital in the U.S. and raise funds uh, from American donors. So what are some of the main goals uh, of the group, of the patrons of Bambino Jesu? Well, we started only uh, in 2023, so we are really the very first steps of our activities. Our uh, goals are to raise funds and raise recognition and awareness of the hospital and its activities, which are mainly three, um, what we call humanitarian care, uh, the hospital, which has 700 beds, uh, treats thousands of children in, uh, in Rome uh, for free every year, which is quite a unique uh, approach to providing health care to children. The second main uh, area of activities is the um, international initiatives. Every year, we train doctors, nurses, and uh, medical personnel in uh, several countries around the world uh, with uh, trainers and doctors from Rome uh, in, uh, in, in many, many countries. Right now, we have 16 countries where we have on-the-ground activities, and these personnel are treated and, and, and trained and developed both in their own countries and in Rome. And the third area of, of, of activities is uh, research and development, that the hospital is recognized as one of the center of excellence in research uh, in Europe and uh, carries out uh, its uh, research and development projects with uh, uh, collaborations with uh, uh, top research centers around the world. And the hospital is so special in so many ways, as you mentioned. Um, how different is it from other children's hospitals around the world? Well, as I mentioned, um, being a research hospital is certainly a unique feature. Uh, we're not the only one. Um, but being a hospital that provides the top, the highest standard of medical care for free is certainly unique. Uh, and uh, we take care uh, of children from all over the world, children that are in need, that otherwise could not get the same level of health care in their own countries. For example, since the beginning of the war uh, in Ukraine, uh, 2,000 Ukrainian children have been treated in Rome and, and hosted with their families, because children obviously need to be taken care of not only from a medical perspective, but also from a, a personal perspective. Uh, perspective. The same now with the um, difficult situation in, in, in Gaza. Um, 500 children are coming to Rome to be treated away from a war zone in Rome at the highest level for free. This is quite unique. It certainly is, Fabrizio. Thank you for taking the time to speak with us about all this, and thank you for the important work that you do. God bless you. Thank you very much. Pope Francis reminds the faithful that falling in love is, quote, an astonishing reality of our existence. Costruire una storia insieme è meglio che andare a caccia di avventure. At his weekly talk at the Vatican, the Holy Father said a person in love is generous. They enjoy giving gifts and focusing on the other person instead of themselves. Pope Francis says this is the opposite of lust, which seeks to enslave us in a world of sin and selfishness. Well, finally tonight, a bit of a pet project, so to speak, in Spain today. This in honor of the country's patron saint for animals. Well, adorable pets and their owners gathered in Madrid to celebrate the feast of St. Anthony of Egypt. The pets were blessed to bring health and protection. The blessings were then followed by a mass where the animals were welcomed into the church. I love that. And thank you for watching tonight. Remember, you can follow us on social media, Facebook, X, and Instagram at EWTN News Nightly. I'm Tracy Sable. Good night and God bless.